So I'm Eric. And, uh, and I'm Tobias. Uh, and um, Tobias will start talking, uh, give you a bit of uh, blockchain background and some nice details. And then I will talk a bit about the smart contract languages that we have in Eternity. Right. So uh, we're uh, from the company Happy Hacking. Well, this is this is sort of happy hacking. But now we're working with uh, Eternity to build this blockchain. And uh, <laughs> wait, so let's do it. Right, uh, and it's a blockchain with scalable smart contracts interfacing with real-world data, and it's written in Erlang. Actually, there is an Elixir e implementation as well, and we're building it now. And the mainnet launch is going to be in a month or so, so we're getting, getting ready. So why are we building this in Erlang? <laughs> so Ulf Wieger gave a presentation that you can find on this link, and uh, someone didn't come here for this conference, so he's giving it again, I think. So you can find it. It will be available in a conference room near you soon, so I will not uh, say anything more on that. So th this is the core Erlang team of et Eternity, and it's, uh, some faces you might recognize. There is uh, some uh, some uh, Erlang experts and some blockchain experts, and uh, together we're working on this to, uh, to build the Eternity. So we're going to do an Erlang dive into the Eternity blockchain. I'm not going to talk about blockchains in general, but it's a the sort of the specific implementation that we are doing in Eternity. Uh, but I'm going to start more or less from scratch anyway. So, what is a blockchain? Well, a blockchain is a chain of blocks. Uh, <laughs> surprise there. And it's a chain in the way that uh, every block has a pointer to the previous block. And the block also has information on which height it has. The height is the, uh, the, high, the distance from the genesis block, which is the first block. And uh, the, uh, since you only have previous pointers, you, can't, you can fork, but you cannot merge again, right? Also, well, what is it in a block then? So this is the, uh, the, the uh, record, in the Erlang record for the block representation. And there's a bunch of stuff, and all not, not that many things. And I will sort of walk you through this, uh, but not line by line in this presentation. So first we can note that this is a block, and this is a header. This is a block, this is a header. What is the difference? Well, the header is the same thing as a block, but it doesn't have transactions. Okay. The identity of a block is the hash of the header. So you basically take all the parts of the header, and then you hash it with a, a cryptographic hash function. We use Blake 2B 256 bits uh, hash to represent the block. And uh, since this hash is the content of the previous hash there. The identity, uh, the, the sort of the uh, structure of the blockchain is not easily tampered with. Okay. So the transactions, the difference between the block and the header is really, you can view it as events in a database. It's an event log for a database or it is a ledger. So transaction is something that should happen to the blockchain state, and when you apply it, something does happen. So this is an uh, example of a spend transaction in Eternity. So we, we want to spend an amount of aeons, or the, the coin in, in Eternity, from a sender account to a recipient's account. And there is some stuff there that I won't talk about now. But as you see, the sender is represented by a sender pub key and the recipient by a recipient pub key. So every account on the chain has a public and private key pair. The identity of an account is the public key. And whenever you want to do something that affects your account in a negative way, you want to add, spend some coin, for example, you will have to sign this with the, secret, uh, with the private key. So this spend transactions uh, transfers an, an amount from one account to another account. 
And basically that is an event that affects the state of, of the blockchain. So, but you don't want to traverse the whole blockchain every time you want to find out what kind of amount, uh, what, what is the current balance of an account. So you use state trees to uh, represent the current, uh, current amount. And in a way, uh, if you look at the similarity to an ordinary distributed database, the, uh, the state trees is really the, the, a snapshot or the, the database and the blockchain is the uh, event log. Um, so state trees are key value stores. Uh, and we use Merkle Patricia trees um, to keep the key value stores. So if you don't know them, they are my new favorite ADT. They're really elegant and uh, very nice in a lot of ways. Uh, but you can view them, and I will go into some depth about this because I like them so much. <laughs> uh, but basically, they are a key value store represented uh, as a tree uh, in, a, in a way that is cryptographically safe. So the tree is, uh, each edge in the tree has a uh, partial key, and the key uh, is really stored as uh, a path in the tree. Uh, and for each node in the tree, you compute a hash based on the subtree and the value at that node. So in this example, uh, you can see, you can follow the, the path in the tree from the root hash at the top, and you see the one, one path will give you the value foo. And the two, three, one will give you the value bar, and the two, three, two, five will give you the value bath. The stuff in quotes there is supposed to represent the hash at each of the uh, nodes. And of course, the hash is much larger in reality, but not in ASCII art. Uh, so, and, the, and the hash at the top, the A4, B9, B is the root hash representing the full content of this tree. The hash function for this example is the Tobias hash, so it won't make any sense. And the, if you noticed in the header, there were two uh, fields called transactions hash and root hash. So the root hash is the uh, uh, Merkle Patricia tree root hash of the state tree. So even though you don't have the state in the actual blockchain or in the header, you have a representation. So you know that when you calculate the state when you, uh, as you traverse the blockchain, you can, uh, you can find that uh, the transactions in the blockchain actually add up to the correct root hash of the state. So you keep the state locally on your node, uh, and you can verify that uh, the root hash in the blockchain actually is the root hash of the state that you have. Hmm? So that is the root hash. Then you have the transactions hash. So remember that the header was the same as the block, except it didn't have the transactions. So the transactions can, uh, in a block, in the correct order, can be put into another Mer Merkle Patricia tree. Ah, I see I wrote MTP there. Uh, it's everyone says differently, and even I at the same presentation. So, uh, so you can know that even though you don't have the tra actual transactions, you can find out that the representation in the block, of the, in the header, is a sort of a condensed version of the block. You can know that the transactions, once you get the block, if you have only the header, you can get the block and you can find out that the, that the header and the block were representing the same thing. Now, so for each block in the blockchain, you will have a corresponding state, state tree. And uh, naively, you could view it like this. So for every position, you have uh, a new state tree. But since we're using the MPTs, it's a bit more clever. So basically, you will get a lot of sharing between the different trees, uh, and you only record the delta in <coughs> for, uh, that happened because of the block. And uh, I have an example of this. So in the, uh, in the first uh, picture, you see the same example as before, but now I added the, the node db there. So 
the key and value in the key value store is sort of the logical key value store that this uh, tree is representing. But the actual how you actually store this is uh, as the part on the right. So you store the nodes which contain enough information to know its subnodes. Uh, and if you change one value, which happens in the in the lower picture, you change from change from foo to gazonk, you will get a new hash at the gazonk node, and you will get a new root hash reflecting that the uh, that state has changed for the, f the whole tree. And if you don't remove the old nodes, but you just add the new nodes, you will have both of these trees represented in the same database. So you just start traversing from the old root hash, and you have all the, uh, all the information that you need to uh, retrieve all the values that was in the old state tree. But with the new one, uh, you get sharing on all the parts that wasn't affected. It's very uh, nice and elegant. So what about mining a block, creating a new block? Well, basically what you do, you, why do you want to mine a block in the first place? Well, you get a minor reward. If you, if you construct a new block and you, uh, you, you put it to the chain, you will get some coin uh, for your effort. And that's the sort of the mining and blockchain. So what you do is that you collect a set of valid transactions. So people send transactions to the chain. Uh, or rather to, to, the, to a node, and they st are stored in something called mempool. And then at a certain interval, we create a new candidate for this one, which is basically a set of transactions. We apply the transactions to get a new state tree. We compute a new state hash, and, uh, and the header, the candidate header for this new block. And then you solve a puzzle in, in order to uh, verify this block. So the puzzle in eternity is the cuckoo cycle. Uh, the puzzle is uh, normally called proof of work, uh, at least for these kinds of blockchains. So what is this? Uh, this is the stuff that people are buying graphic cards for or a, and a huge computer to, to solving these puzzles. This is, the, this is when you need the real computing power. And uh, the solving of the puzzle is not done in Erlang. Uh, but the coordination of solving the puzzle is written in our line. So in the header, we had, the, had these fields, the target, the nonce, the <coughs> proof of work evidence, and the miner. So the miner is the public key of the one uh, running the node. So if you put your public key there, you will get some reward if you solve the puzzle. The hash of the header together with a nonce, which is basically a random uh, integer, uh, describes a graph in the cuckoo world. And if you find a cycle in that graph of a specific length, then you have solved the, prob uh, solved the puzzle. However, you also we don't accept any solutions to it. This is determined by the target. So the target limits what the solutions are acceptable in the blockchain, and the target uh, is the variable that, that adjusts how often a new block can be, can be uh, produced. So if you have a lot of miners uh, solving this problem, you need to increase the target, decrease the target. I never remember uh, which way it goes. But, but you, you change the target so that the problem gets more difficult to solve. So it's uh, self-adjusting. You look at the block uh, a couple of headers back, and you, you change the target accordingly according to a uh, set specification. Right. So, in this crash course on alternative blockchain, we've now covered all the, all the parts of what a block is and sort of the essential parts for getting an understanding, perhaps, on what we're trying to do. So the blockchain is a ledger or an event log. And the state described by ledger is stored in state trees, which is basically a key value store, even though it's much better. And the block contains all these things. So now we can walk through it. So the version is just the version of the consensus protocol. If you change something, you bump the, the protocol, and you introduce uh, a fork, a soft fork in the chain, saying that I must now 
come up to this consensus protocol level if you want to continue be being a part of the network. The time is uh, when you actually mine this block, and the time is uh, used uh, to calculate the target. You have the height, which is the distance from, the, uh, from Genesis. Previous hash shows the structure uh, of the blockchain. You have the miner who mined this block and who should get rewarded for it. You have the transactions and the transaction hash representing the transactions if you only want the header. You have the root hash proving that you calculated the correct balances or the correct state for this point in, in uh, the blockchain. Uh, you have the target which uh, adjusts the difficulty or the timing of producing new blo blocks. You have the nuns and the proof of work evidence that together uh, shows that you actually <coughs> solved the puzzle in order to produce the block. But now Hoppy is gonna take over and tell you what attorney is trying to do that is new. So, no, yes, maybe. <laughs> so after that crash course in uh, blockchain, uh, we're working with Eternity, which is a blue new blockchain. And one of the big things with this blockchain is that there are a number of things that have come up in different blockchains that have been tried, and people realize that these are things that you really want to have on a on a blockchain, and they have been implemented uh, uh, ad hoc and as smart contracts uh, on some blockchains. And on Eternity, instead, we try to have these as first-class objects, and they are oracles, names, token, governance, state channels, and contracts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. So oracles, that's just a way of getting information from the real world or the outside world into the blockchain. And uh, the uh, Eternity oracles is structured data. So it's data that follows the uh, way data looks in uh, the Sophia language, which is the language that you can program this blockchain in that I'm going to talk about in a little while. So you could have anything you want there. You can just have a true-false value, or you can have a string that of arbitrary size, basically, uh, with any information that you want. So this way you can get information on the blockchain, and then you uh, can do things with this. Another thing is names. So uh, as to be as we're talking about these uh, accounts that uh, you have. Uh, uh, just as a pub key. So the the pub key is this hash uh, that is a long string of uh, digits or letters uh, that no one really uh, can remember. So you want names so that you can refer to to your account in some easy way. So there's a way to register a name and connect that name to an account on the chain. And then there's tokens. So uh, there's a basic token, which is uh, the one that miner gets rewarded in, and which is the basic, uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm allowed to use the word currency here, but um, you could call it a currency. Um, I will be killed by my boss. But um, uh, then there are uh, these other tokens that you can create. So um, if you, for example, uh, want to represent uh, real-world objects and tracking them, uh, you can have tokens for these, uh, tracking uh, cheese shipments or whatever you want to do. Um, or uh, they can be representing digital content. So if you want to have an uh, axe in a, in a game, uh, you can have a token that represents that X, and then you can 
transfer it uh, between owners and that way trade in online uh, digital content. Uh, they can also be used uh, to to create many uh, tokens for uh, ICO like things. So, if you, for example, want to make a game, you can say that okay, I will create these uh, one million tokens, and you can buy them. And if you have these tokens, then you can get a copy of the game when it's finished. Uh, so, uh, that's the tokens, and you can. Uh, trade them on the on the blockchain transfer them between accounts there's also governance and basically governance is just a way of voting so uh, you prove uh, somehow that you have some stake in uh, something on the chain and then you can uh, cast a vote on a subject that someone has posted and uh, it's going to be used, for example, to decide on uh, minimum uh, fees for transactions and other things that related to the chain and mining. Uh, but basically, it can be used uh, for anything where you want to uh, uh, do some voting. And in order to not have every transaction uh, on the chain where it needs to be verified by a miner and where you have to pay a fee for it to be included. You can also start as open a state channel and then you can do transactions in the state channel and you don't have to uh, settle every transaction on the chain. Instead, uh, you and the one you're uh, trading with uh, double sign uh, transactions in the state channel. So this is uh, our main uh, way of increasing scalability of the chain. So reducing the number of on-chain transactions instead of doing them in uh, state channels. And you can do things that you cannot really do with uh, on-chain transactions. You could, for example, pay for every frame of a streaming movie. Uh, so uh, if you would have to do that on the chain, uh, every transaction would have a couple of seconds, in best case probably minutes round trip time before you know that it's settled. Uh, and that would not be feasible if you want to do this uh, for every frame of a movie. Uh, so in this way you can trustlessly buy a movie and you don't know whether you will uh, get it or not, but you will only pay for as much as you get. And to bring it all together, we have smart contracts, and that's uh, what I'm going to talk about now. And smart contracts, uh, some people say they are not smart and they're not contracts. And uh, that uh, sums it up very well. It's actually just uh, code that you can execute uh, on the chain. So we had a number of goals when we started designing the smart contracts for Eternity. They should be safe. Um, they should be efficient and they should scale. And uh, execution should be cheap. And this should be a simple way to migrate from previous uh, smart contracts like Ethereum uh, smart contracts. Unfortunately, these four goals are not really compatible. So um, uh, we'll see how we'll be able to do that. Uh, the first one is that uh, contract execution should be safe. Uh, and with that, we mean that we can prove properties of the contract. So you write your contract, and then you write some properties that you want to hold, uh, like funds are only transferred once and uh, things like this. So we have designed a functional language called Sophia uh, and the new safe virtual machine uh, for the win virtual machine. And contracts should be efficient and scale. Uh, well, the, the main way to scale an eternity is the state channels. Uh, but also to get efficient uh, contract execution, we have a high level language, uh, a scripting language uh, for really fast execution. 
and contract execution should be cheap. And this is not really something that you can control in on a blockchain where uh, actually it's the miners that decide uh, which transactions they're going to handle and people want to execute their contracts on the chain, they're willing to pay whatever they want to get them executed. So uh, it's very hard to uh, set the price. But by providing these, uh, this very uh, uh, efficient uh, contract language, we hope to be able to have efficient execution and being able to keep the price low. And then you want to be able to go from Ethereum. So uh, we have also implemented the EVM so that you can uh, run Ethereum contracts on the e Eternity blockchain. Yeah. So the four goals, they are not easy to combine, so we're not really trying to combine them. Instead, we're going to do several different solutions uh, to do this. So the first one is to be able to run the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, so we have a, a implementation of the EVM, and uh, that way you can take uh, contracts that you have already written for the e EVM and run them more or less directly on the Eternity blockchain. Th this also means that we get a lot of uh, already written contracts that we can uh, run on our uh, blockchain and uh, do performance testing of the the blockchain and see how we're doing. We have made some improvements on the EVM, uh, so we have a more safe self-destruct instruction. Uh, we're using a different hash. We're introducing subroutines and uh, possibility to uh, access more stack positions. So since we're doing a functional language on top of this machine, you, you will need more stack and some bit manipulation instructions. Subroutines will probably come to EVM also. But to uh, get a safe language, we uh, uh, have designed SOFIA. Uh, so it's a type functional programming language. It's uh, uh, sort of a dialect of ML, uh, close to, to reason, but nowadays it has evolved to have significant white space also, so uh, it's uh, looking a, a bit like uh, Python also, but um, it has its roots in ML. It right now it compiles to, to the EVM, and the goal is that it will also compile to the uh, for the Win virtual machine. There will be a way to define properties uh, on SOFIA contracts, and then you should be able to prove that uh, these properties hold, or disprove them, and then you cannot compile your uh, program. So here's an example of a simple uh, SOFIA contract. Uh, you have types, and you can declare your uh, own types and uh, the state uh, is a special type that stores data between contract executions. You have functions, you can call them and um, uh, as it, you don't see that much in this example, the, the curly brackets they are for records, it's not blocks, so uh, there are no block delimiters, it's uh, white space. Uh, here is a another example, um, taking two arguments uh, and then doing a call where you say how much gas uh, you want to use uh, for doing this call. And the SOFIA compiler is typed, and it keeps the types all the way down to the uh, bytecode. So the for the win virtual machine is a functional type boarded virtual machine. So you would 
normally say that it's a, a functionally typed checked virtual machine, but it doesn't make for a nice abbreviation. So uh, it's a worded virtual machine. It's functional, and one of the aspects of that is that uh, uh, data is tagged and it has uh, automatic mem management and associative memory. Uh, not exactly functional, but associated with many functional programs. It's typed, so all instructions are uh, typed and all memory positions are typed and tagged in the machine. And it's warded, so every instruction is checked for overflow and underflow and so on. We're also making another language called Varna, uh, so that uh, means basically type, also a city in uh, Bulgaria. Uh, so it's sort of similar to Bitcoin script. It's uh, a language without loops. Uh, and you can basically decide uh, the cost for, for running these contracts at compile time. So they should be easy and cheap. But since we have so many first order objects in Eternity, we have the oracles and uh, uh, governance and so on, the language is still very powerful, even though it's a simple language. So uh, you can create a by token function that um, you send in some uh, Aeon tokens, and um, then you use it in Oracle to calculate the price. And if you have a, then right amount of tokens, they will be transferred. So you can refer to all these things like tokens and oracles and uh, so on directly in the Varna contract. So even if you cannot write loops, you can uh, get uh, working uh, interesting code pretty easily. And the Varna is compiled to HLM, uh, the high-level uh, machine. It's uh, basically not really a virtual machine. It's just a uh, Erlang code that is doing the checking of uh, blocks and before mining uh, that will also uh, execute this uh, code. And the HLM syntax looks like this, but no one should uh, ever have to read that except for the poor implementer of the HLM machine. So don't worry about it. So we're uh, building a new blockchain with uh, first-class objects, and uh, we have three different languages uh, because we have so uh, different goals. Uh, so we want to be uh, safe, and we have a complex language for that, but with proofs. And we have a simple language for day-to-day -day programming, and then we have a Solidity and EVM for backwards compatibility. That's it.